Pachow hovercraft. Not only are they real, but they are louder, bigger, and cooler than anything that Luke was riding around in in Moss Eisley. Also, if there's any weird banging in the background of my video, that's my cat being obsessed with the screensaver I have on right now. Right now, she's sort of behaving. Cats aside, today we're going to talk about them, because I think they're neat. So that's, that's the reason. So boat stuff, the like and subscribe button, and let's get this video started. Peep under the underside of some of the Navy's boats, and you just might find yourself a Landing Craft Air Cushion, or LCAC. Not only is that a funny name, but it's a hovercraft, and that's cool. You can also paint Heath Ledger's Joker face on them, and apparently that's enough to make the news these days. But here we are. LCAT crews are hand-selected from the Navy's pool of epic gamers, in case you're curious. Think of hovercraft as modern-day Higgins boats. These are one of the primary ways that the Navy moves stuff from a big boat to the beachhead, and can carry 75 tons worth of anything that will fit on it from ammo, trucks, tanks, or necessary morale equipment for the Marines. But why use a hovercraft instead of just a boat? Today I want to talk about all kinds of hovercraft, from past, present, and future, and how they're used in combat. And then, at the end, we're going to talk about something that may or may not be a hovercraft, but it doesn't matter if it is, because I also think it's cool, and this is my YouTube channel. The whole idea behind hovercraft is to get a bunch of from boat to land quickly, but not too much If you need to move too much you use an actual boat. But if you have a reasonably moderate amount of to move, or have relatively little time, you would use an LCAC to move said <laughs> Modern hovercraft, also known as OTB, or over the beach craft, use air cushions called skirts to physically hover just above the surface. American LCACs utilize four Allison 501 K34 turbine engines to do their hovering, two to push it forward and two to create the lift. Each fan moves about 1.3 million cubic feet of air per minute, meaning it could fill an Olympic-sized pool in less than 30 seconds. To illustrate just how impressive that is, I have created a time-lapse of what that would look like in real life. Very impressive. Fun fact also, these are one of, if not the most expensive vehicle that can be commanded by an enlisted guy. The rest use officers. Not that we're doing much better though. Looking at these, your first thought might be that any kind of bullet, even one from Mima's Pump Action 22 she uses to scare off solicitors, would be enough to punch a hole in the skirt and deflate the whole thing and sink it. And while yes, it would be very easy to put a rifle bullet hole right in the middle of that thing, it's not really a concern. See, the rubber skirt isn't actually sealed. It purposely leaks air in order to provide a small gap that pushes the craft along and reduces friction. The pressure inside of the skirt is actually pretty low, only about 6 to 8 psi depending on its setting. For reference, your car tire pressure is about 4 to 5 times that. If the skirt starts to get peppered with small arms fire, they can just increase the air engine outputs into the skirt to maintain higher pressures. But the fact that pressure is spread out so much, about 1800 square feet worth of cushion, it's still fully able to lift the 190 ton weight of the thing when it's fully loaded. You would be better off just trying to blow the whole thing up with a Bissell barrage rather than just trying to pop the underside of it. That lack of friction allows it to travel over 46 miles per hour pending the terrain or how choppy the water is that it's going over. Now these can be armed with weapons, specifically they have two mounts for a couple of M240 Bravos, but if the LCAC dude is having to lay down suppressive fire, things have gone more ass backwards than a, uh, the, I don't know, a backwards ass factory. You know, not every joke I write on here is gonna be a home run. But why use these instead of just like a normal landing craft? Landing craft boats are simpler, quieter, more fuel efficient, cheaper, easier to operate, easier to fix, carry more stuff, can go farther, and are easier to store. Well, the first thing, hovercraft are cooler, we've already made that apparent, but the main thing is that these things can land pretty much anywhere that isn't just a sheer cliff face. And then they can just continue on to the actual beach instead of having to wade out in the water, and they're also not subject to a lot of the threats of a conventional ship. See, the Navy considers most boats as displacement hull craft, meaning they have to generate buoyancy by pushing water out of the way. Which is what navies have been using since the Egyptians fought the Sea Peoples in 1175 BC. But that requires that enough of the boat is physically underwater for the whole thing to float. It's something something Archimedes principle. 
That also means that things like mines or underwater obstacles could either blow them up or stop them before they made it close enough to shore to deploy everything inside. Also, if you want to use a typical landing craft, you have to find the sweet spot in terms of a beach that has the specific topography that will let marines get ashore but not be so shallow that you strand the whole boat. If you use a normal boat landing craft, it's going to be super obvious where you're dropping your crayon eaters on the beach. That means that any defending force that isn't commanded by someone with an extra chromosome will know to focus their defenses on those specific spots. But, if you have an LCAC, you can pretty much just land wherever you want and keep going on to the actual land. Doesn't matter how deep or shallow the water is. Before I go any further, I first need to take a breather and tell you guys about the shirt that you see me wearing and the shorts that you don't. These are from today's sponsor, Arrowhead Tactical which offer athletic apparel that you can conceal carry in. From shorts to joggers and even the holsters themselves, they are designed for shooters by shooters. These are perfect for people who want to carry without declaring it to the entire world that you're carrying. They work with any kind of carry position and can even hold full-size handguns while doing all the normal movements you'd expect out of premium athletic wear. And they come in men's and women's. I have been wearing them all over town, to the gym, to the grocery store, to the other places you can find me at. And I can tell you, they're great. They're super comfortable. They work as intended. And the fact that the waistbands are ruggedized for your concealed carry needs, it actually makes it so they're legitimately more comfortable than other shorts that I've worn. Now there's a lot more benefits that I would like to cover, but I'm at the end of my allotted time for this. So make sure you check them out with the link that you see here on screen and that I have down in the description. Thank you Arrowhead Tactical for helping to support the channel. Now back to the video. Now the Navy has been using these LCACs for a while now. They're based on a prototype developed by Bell Aerospace called the Jeff B. Not to be confused with the Jeff A prototype or Jeff G, which is a man and not a boat. These were first operational back in 1986, and got their first real deployment in 1991 during the first Gulf War, but not in the way you might think. In the lead up to the crossing of the border into Iraq, the Navy conducted a very well publicized amphibious exercise, with LCACs being at the forefront. Combined with a dabble of false intelligence on the part of some secret squirrel types, it led Saddam and his army to believe that a massive amphibious invasion would strike Kuwait City. This led the Iraqi army to move six entire divisions, including members of their elite Republican Guard, to defend the coastline. The diversion continued with naval gunfire and false radio transmissions, along with the American government highlighting the Marines in particular as the spearhead to liberate Kuwait. The point was to basically make it look like we were conducting Operation Overlord Part 2, but that landing never came, the deception tactic worked flawlessly, and we all know who did the real heavy lifting back in 91. While the LCACs did see use in 2003 during the invasion of Iraq for logistical purposes and have done a lot of humanitarian work, despite the fact that we've had them for 40 years, they've never actually seen any combat. Which again, uh, not a bad thing, because a pair of 240s ain't gonna do much against an entire coastal defensive line. But despite being 40 years old, they have seen quite a bit of upgrades since then. But now the boat boys are looking at a new design called the Ship to Shore Connector, which is admittedly not as fun a name, but I don't think the Navy cares what I think, and frankly, I don't care what they think either. These will offer better payload capacity compared to the LCAC and have more fuel-efficient engines, and that's good because current ones burn 1,000 gallons of JP-8 fuel per hour, which is roughly the same as my neighbor's lifted truck. But these are expected to last at least 30 years in the Navy, and by that, they probably mean adopted, then cut production numbers to three and serve about five years before they go back to the original LCAC model. But the old US of A ain't the only people using these things. Japan uses the LCAC-1, which is a modified version of what Americans use. Same goes for South Korea's LSF-2, but those are a lot beefier in order to hold the heavier K-2 tanks and K-21 IFVs, and can handle the rougher coastal terrain found in and around the peninsula. Strategically, these would be used to augment American equipment getting ashore if Kim decided to get a little froggy, and to hit coastal targets to the north of the DMZ in order to split DPRK forces into a two-front war. The Swedes deployed the 8000TD and the 8100TD hovercraft. 
These are significantly smaller than their American cousins, with the larger 8100 model only able to carry a little over 20 tons of equipment. But they're better suited for riverine style operations and are pretty flexible as to where they can go. Along with that, they're also better suited for the colder conditions up there. Our friends over in the People's Republic of China use the Type 726 Yuyi class, also known as the Wild Horse. The PLAN have about 40 of these in their arsenal, according to current estimates, and first deployed them back in 2007. These are slightly larger than the American version, and are able to carry a single Type 96 main battle tank, or a couple ZBD-05 IFVs. Apparently, these weren't good enough, and China has now opted to just building a massive bridge in order to invade Taiwan. Different strokes for different folks, I guess. Now, for Russia. Now, the Russian Navy, in case you didn't know, likes building really, really big ships, and their version of the LCAC is no exception to this rule. That being the Zuber class. These are the largest hovercraft in the world, and are currently in use by the Russian Navy, the Hellenic Navy, and China on top of their indigenous designs. Uh, but Greece, being Greece, didn't realize how expensive LCACs are, so they had to retire two of theirs early because the upkeep was too expensive, and have since pulled their mothball triremes out of storage. Now these are enclosed on top, unlike western designs. There's pros and cons to this in terms of physically fitting things inside the actual pontoon portion of the boat, but would actually be a major benefit against loitering munitions and drones and stuff. This was primarily done originally to protect the insides from seaburn threats, with the whole interior being air sealed and climate controlled. It even has active magnetic protection systems, which help protect it from things like magnetic underwater mines. Powered by a total of five 10,000 horsepower gas turbine engines, it's able to reach speeds of 72 miles per hour and can carry 555 tons fully loaded. That's both nearly twice as fast as an LCAC and four times the weight, being able to deploy three main battle tanks at once instead of just one. And in my opinion, was a smart move on the Soviets back in the 80s when they designed this thing, because it meant you could deploy an entire platoon's worth of tanks at once instead of just one at a time, or an entire company's worth of IFVs and APCs. One of the hardest parts of any amphibious assault is building combat power at your landing zone. So if you can do it in just one go, you're able to be more aggressive in catching the defenders off guard. Allegedly, because of the sheer size of these things, the massive water spray that it generated as it was traveling was big enough to confuse radars. Whether or not that's true, I don't know. Who's to say? But I do know this thing would pop up hotter on thermals than the one hot plate I used to cook everything in my apartment. Now these have been noticeably absent from the Ukraine war. Despite Russia wanting to restart the production of these bad boys back in 2017, we haven't been seeing them. Early in the war, many analysts warned of an amphibious attack on Odessa, which Zubers would have absolutely been a part of, but combined with military failures in southern Ukraine by Russia, the fact that Ukraine managed to punch above its weight in the Black Sea, and that they would be target numero uno for any kind of coastal defenses, they never saw action. For Russia, it just made sense for them to focus on leveraging units for a ground war rather than take a massive risk on an amphibious landing that may or may not work out. Now something that kind of fits, kind of doesn't fit into this hovercraft classification is the Soviet Loon class Ekranoplane, which was the only ground effect vehicle ever to be operationally produced. Instead of an inflated skirt, it generated lift that made it flow just about 13 feet off the actual surface of the water. Nicknamed the Caspian Sea Monster, it was able to travel at speeds up to 342 miles per hour and at a range of 1,200 miles. While it did have the ability to carry about 100 metric tons of equipment, the primary role this played was as a mobile missile carrier. The idea was that because it was so fast and low to the water, NATO radar systems would struggle to detect it until it had already fired its payload. That's actually kind of similar as to how I was conceived as a human being, but that's a story for a different time. Once in range of a capitalist pig aircraft carrier group, it would launch its six P-270 Mosket anti-ship missiles and make the bring of greatest glory to Soviet Union. That is, except they only actually built one of these as functional, and it never saw action, so it goes into the same category of other weird USSR designs that garner more interest in internet forums and YouTube videos than they did in the actual engineers who invented them. 
Moon classes could only fly in absolutely perfect weather, and they couldn't generate enough lift to get above even small waves, so their actual use in real life would have been incredibly limited. At least they got some love in World of Conflict. Now let's change gears a little bit and talk about the tactics of using a hovercraft. Beach landings suck. They're hard, dangerous, and incredibly risky. If they weren't, they wouldn't make such great openings for movies. One of the best ways to actually deploy an LCAC into a fight is with an OTH strategy, or over the horizon. Not to get too political on this channel, but the Earth is curved, meaning if you're far away enough, beach defenders won't be able to see your navy. Ships are very tall, meaning they can be seen from farther away. LCACs are a lot shorter, only being about 23 feet tall at their highest point. This means that it takes a lot longer for them to be spotted from the beach. Doing some fancy math, we get that an LCAC deployed beyond line of sight will be spotted roughly 6 miles away on a clear summer's day, and that's a distance that they're able to cross in 7.5 minutes at full speed. That, generally speaking, is a short enough time window if you're able to find a part of the beach that wasn't already defended, and you'll be able to get there before they can call in any kind of quick reaction force to come and try to stop you. But you don't deploy LCACs by themselves. Once it's decided that an island has had it too good for too long and the Navy wants to send in the hovercraft, they'll first start with missile and aerial bombardment of defensive positions. Now you don't want to completely mass all of your fires exactly where you're going to land, because if you do, it's a dead giveaway to your landing spot, and that will give enemy reserves or QRF forces a chance to beat you to the beach. While the air and missile strikes are happening, the landing crafts start to make their move. While things like LAVs and ACVs or older AAVs are amphibious and can traverse the water themselves, it's not uncommon for them to be sent on LCACs for deployment because they're able to hit the ground a lot faster than if they move themselves. They then make their way to what are called CLZs or Cushion Landing Zones by navigating through what's called an approach lane. These lanes are predetermined areas to be freed of things that would snag the LCACs up, like mines and obstacles, or allow for an approach that has poor sight lines from the shore to make it harder for defenders to engage. This is why oftentimes the LCAC won't sail directly to the shore, and will actually move in a pattern that reduces exposure to identified coastal defenses. If a beach is large enough, or if speed is more important, individual ACVs and LAVs will deploy simultaneously with the ones on the LCAC hitting points that are closer to their objectives, while the LCAC hits the ones that are farther out. LCACs also often deploy with the support of helicopter or V-22 borne troops. Once your EA-18 Growlers have effectively spanked enemy air defenses enough with a handful of harm missiles, Marines can land ahead of the beach as a screening force, and that isolates the beach from enemy forces and allows the LCACs to land without worrying about enemy reinforcements arriving. In certain kinds of operations, like an amphibious raid, the LCAC will actually land directly on or right adjacent to the actual objective. In situations like these, surprise is one of the most important aspects, so the landing crafts will not have any kind of air or naval fire support until they've hit the beach already. Amphibious assaults are another mission they'd undertake, but unlike a raid where the forces return to their ships after destroying a person, place, or thing, they stay and hold the ground. These are often more deliberate types of operations, so things like integrating fire support and air attacks will be more common. During those kinds of operations, the first wave of LCACs will be used to bring troops and armor to land in order to establish a foothold on the coast. They then can start turn and burn movements with reinforcements and logistical support on the newly acquired oceanfront property. Now, LCACs have recently gotten a bit of a second wind as China's been eyeing Taiwan for quite a while now. So 2030 might be the magical year that these things finally see in actual combat. Or maybe by then we'll have some new anti-grav lift thing and deploy wraith tanks onto beaches. I'm happy with either one. But either way, I hope you enjoyed the video. Make sure you check out the description for the link for Arrowhead Tactical's new gear. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe and I will see you in the next one.